Hi, I'm Pastor Colin at Aletheia Bible Fellowship. This week we are introing discipleship for the next couple months. And so we took a look at what discipleship is to God and how it is central to him and his identity and how he works and therefore central to how we should be transforming our lives and following him as his disciples. So if you want to be prepared for the next couple months, go ahead and take a close gander at this sermon and go ahead and like and subscribe if that's something that you want to be updated on. It is good to see everybody. So good that I wanted to be extra amplified to emphasize it. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, we're moving on from the last couple months about scripture and the word of God and all of that that Adam just covered and moving into discipleship and talking about the foundations of that in scripture and the the essential doctrines of our faith and how discipleship kind of folds into that. Um, and this is, of course, the year of devotion, the last year in our five-year cycle. And it's pretty easy to see how discipleship um, really fits into that theme of being devoted to God. Because discipleship, right, is a entire life-encompassing um, pursuit. It is something that involves our whole self um, in one person following the whole self of another person. So it's going to be a good couple months going over that. The basic discipleship definition, um, right, is kind of in the root word of it. Discipleship is um, linked with the word discipline, right, and honing craft and skill and wrapped into that is learning along with it. This is in the context of God, of following and learning what it is to be like Christ. <clears throat> but in general, a disciple is a follower and a student of another person, one who seeks to develop a skill or a discipline through the mentorship of a more developed and skilled person. At the root, we are disciples We should start out and look at that real quick. So Jesus was saying to those who believed him, if you continue in my word, which is a good little segue from last month, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is not an offer of direct mentorship, but an eternal mentorship through the very word of God. Right? This is the foundation of discipleship. As Paul says, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. And so that's what it is, is we are initially the disciples of Christ. And I want to establish that point and establish it firmly and quickly before we move on for, from it. Um, it's the eternal mem mentorship through the very word of God in Christ which we established over the last couple months as being paramount in terms of holding scripture as a high standard and being fully invested in that. That's our primary discipleship relationship is with Jesus Christ. That's what I'm going to call it. Our primary discipleship relationship under Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit whom Christ left to assist us in that process. Through that, all disciples are to be united under this common master. Right? And Paul makes that point to the Corinthians in response to their issues of infighting and division in 1 Corinthians 1, um, starting in verse 12. Each one of you is saying, I'm with Paul, or I'm with Apollos, or I'm with Cephas, or I am with Christ. But Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, all are united because we have a common master Jesus Christ in our primary discipleship relationship. It's just a, a comprehensive one. <clears throat> um, and in that, a lot, of, a lot of times the word used is master, right? Jesus is our Lord and master because it is like a master and apprentice relationship. It's, it's just a comprehensive one. It's not just in carpentry or HVAC or electrical or... Um, you know, anything else that you might use that verbiage for, but across the whole span of life. 
Which brings us to the next form of discipleship, because if there's a primary, then there's going to be a secondary. Secondarily, we are to take other believers as disciples under the example which Jesus set in his ministry with his disciples. Following the Great Commission in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples and so on and so forth. For our purposes this month, the word discipleship is going to be referring to this secondary discipleship relationship between two people as an outworking of our devotion to God through those other people in the body of Christ. That's what we're going to be looking at mostly. Um, And for now, you can think of mentorship and discipleship as pretty much synonymous since we use a lot of that term at ABF. For now, we'll just call them synonymous. So let's start this discussion really by looking at a topic as foundational as the knowledge of God, right? How we know the truth about God. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13 through about 18 or so. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, of course, he chimed up and answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So I ask, based on that scripture, what's the difference between those with the right understanding, the right knowledge of God, and where that comes from? Um... The knowledge is different because people are looking to different sources for that. So Jesus says, you're blessed because this knowledge didn't come from any man. It came from God. But what is the channel by which that came? That knowledge came through discipleship because he asked his disciples, it said, who is the son of man? And they have the right answer. Whereas the other people, the other people that followed Jesus, you know, um, were looking to him for good teaching and wisdom and were intrigued by Christ, infatuated with him perhaps. They were making speculations as to who he was. But Jesus said his disciples knew it because God had revealed it to them. I would posit to you that this is because they were in a holy and sanctified and approved discipleship relationship. Knowledge from a discipleship relationship that God intends real knowledge of himself to be passed from master to student over again and through the, through the generations. That is the mechanism by which God <clears throat> will build his church. And lastly, this understanding of spirituality takes place not in a, a safe training ground, right? They were out in the wild. It's a spiritual battlefield. And just like training, just like as an apprentice, you can have all the books and all the weapons You can have all the YouTube channels, but who can transform themselves into a true warrior or a true master of their craft without somebody to teach them, somebody to take them through all of the the messy situations, all the difficult and challenging situations that need support? Who can be a true warrior without a master to teach them? It's very hard. In the journey of the karate kid, you know, Danny lived closely with Miyagi and navigated all sorts of challenges in life from personal discipline to romance and physical threats to his safety to fear itself, navigating all these different things of life. Classically, everyday tasks and opportunities were employed to drive home those lessons, you know, painting and sanding and all this stuff. There's a reason why (laughs) 
and I can attest to this, when you search movies about mentorship, it's at the top of the list. Boom, Karate Kid. Maybe it's not, it doesn't have all perfect examples, um, but they, there's a real substance to it and there's a real passion behind it in terms of the value that, that people um, take from having somebody that is a wise master that is willing to work with you through life, right? This is discipleship in a nutshell, except for it's about God. It's about knowledge of God and his commands and how to live by them day in and day out, and not so much about karate. Discipleship is about knowledge of God being taught through all life, including something like karate. Karate is not the goal, right? Karate is the means by which we learn about God, and that's how all things should be. what that looks like. Next month is going to be the, the case studies of it, looking at how that is done, those examples. So that's going to be really cool. But for now, we're looking at the foundation. And that's what this month is all about. Why discipleship is essential to the Christian faith. Not just essential as a wise or a necessary practice, but necessary as a theological and doctrinally central issue. We live in a God-centric world, regardless of what everybody wants to pretend or purport. So let's start this discussion about discipleship with God in his rightful place at the center of our world. Because discipleship is intimately connected to God's identity, so we should take it very seriously as a part of our identity too. What is discipleship to God? What is discipleship to God? Well, first of all, starting at the very top, you know, look at the Father and the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God. This parental relationship has discipleship at its core identity, definitionally, and that is not on accident. Jesus was a disciple of his Father in heaven. As it says in Colossians 1.15, he's the visible image of the invisible God, as that creed begins. Jesus is different, but looking the same as the Father. This is essentially the goal of discipleship, is it not? Simply put, to make a living copy of a godly person. Jesus was a living flesh copy of his Father in heaven. That's what we want. Was it always like this between God the Father and the Son? In a sense, yes. They are eternal and they have that eternal relationship. And that father-son dynamic is eternal. But in another sense, not quite. There's a timeline in which we get the intentful benefit of seeing that discipleship play out. Hebrews 5, 7 to 8 says, While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Jesus was undoubtedly a disciple himself. He learned obedience from following the will of God through and through in all aspects of life. <clears throat> and we're to do the same. From, he did it by spending much time with his father. Right? He was known for going out and praying and having that dedicated time, alone time, mentor time, if you will, with his father and working it out. What was the best way to, to carry out his will to be that effective, visible image? Discipleship relationship. In Luke 2, Jesus showed himself to be a disciple of his heavenly father <clears throat> because he literally, this is when uh, Jesus was a boy and his family went to Jerusalem for Passover and when they came back, Jesus didn't follow them. He literally didn't follow Joseph, his earthly father, home and went to God's temple instead. And Jesus implies that Joseph is not actually his real father, which is true. 
Like Joseph was not his biological fa father. <clears throat> and even confuses his family. Because Jesus, we'll see, is, is really coming into his understanding of this discipleship relationship as we see it coalescing and coming together before our very eyes in the flesh. Luke 2, 46. Let's go over it. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him, Jesus, were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. They didn't understand what he meant. Up to that point, Jesus was a young boy going through normal family stuff, right? But at the age of 12, when we might expect a person to really connect those dots in a profound way, we see it happening. There are tons of instances where Jesus recognizes that discipleship relationship that he has with his father. One more good one being in John 5, 19 through 20. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son does also. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. This is discipleship in plain terms. And I love it. You know, the father shows the son what he's doing. The son works to do what the father is doing. This is how master and apprentice works. This is how disciple and master work. Same dynamic. And there's love involved in that. What can we take from this? God values discipleship so much that we even see it within the Trinity at the very basic foundation and nature of it. The holy and eternal relationship of Father and Son. But before we fully move on, in the following verses there in Luke 2, we see that Jesus is not only the disciple of his Father in heaven, we see something else in verse 51. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, his parents. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Jesus was obedient and sinlessly so. He submitted to his parents' discipline, not to say that he was sinning and needed discipline to correct his sinful error, right? But in the normal process of growing up, he's getting direction from his parents. He's getting guidance. He's growing up in a normal family structure. Um, it's more like, you know, oh, Jesus, you should scrub the pot like this. And Jesus is like, sure thing, Mom. That sounds like a good idea. Or, hey, Jesus, hit the chisel like this, and you'll make a cleaner edge on the wood. And Jesus is like, oh, yeah, totally. Thanks, Dad. Not to be 1950s like you know, whatever Jesus here. <clears throat> but we can see that even Jesus was a good disciple of his father and mother because you have to ask, why did Mary stole, store all these things in her heart, you know, as she's making these observations? Well, one of the reasons is that she's storing these things internally and kind of keeping track of them is because they were in contrast to the everyday activities of a boy with his family. Like, he was engaged in these normal relationships that you and I have had, you know, with our parents or with the mentors uh, that we have. <clears throat> Not every moment was a profound moment. And Mary was even confused by Jesus' statement about his father, capital F, because he typically led a normal life within his family structure. Most times, Jesus was simply being a good disciple of his father, Joseph. So that's cool, because we see how discipleship is built right into the design of mankind through the family, right? Which is an ordained institution from God, and even one that even Jesus, the incarnated second person of the Trinity, took full part in as a devoted disciple himself. Each child of a family automatically has discipleship relationships, and these should not be taken for granted, but they should be viewed as such and thought of with the depth 
that they deserve. By God's biological design and order, this is the case. Proverbs is a classic book of wisdom. Let's read the intro and think about how appealing it sounds to you as you hear it. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. And it goes on. These are kind of amazing promises if you actually look at them for what they are promising. Um, for those who take Proverbs seriously. And Solomon continues with a blessing in verse 5. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Fear of the Lord is a foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. It's kind of quite the intro. It really is. But what is the first morsel of wisdom after that you know, loaded intro with a bunch of heavy and bold promises? What is the first morsel of wisdom from the wisest man to live? What takes the honored seat at the table of understanding? Verse 8. My child, listen when your father corrects you and don't neglect your mother's instruction. This is the very first thing that's said after that loaded intro. Take your God-given discipleship seriously, is what Solomon says as his first opportunity to present wisdom. This is not only about honoring your parents because God said so. Remember the intro. You know, It's about wisdom and discipline and success, growing into a deeply moral, deeply righteous man or woman. And in this fallen world, not all parents have taken well or at all to discipleship. But do not lose the connection at the expense of the fallen world. Because regardless, God designed the family to be the first guaranteed environment for discipleship from day one of a person's life. And it's, it is saying something when we're looking at the nature and the foundation of discipleship that it's not even an option. It's not like you're born and you have the option of, of um, being a, a disciple or not. You are born with your brain fully geared to be a disciple, period. We're trying to pretend in this world like kids should or want the ability to navigate the world on their own and make their own choices. It doesn't work. It crashes and burns. But God built into our very biology that we are to be disciples without choice. And that is significant and something that we should remember for the rest of our lives. Not just forget it when we're 18. So we shouldn't lose that connection. <clears throat> this is not done by God purely by practicality or happenstance, but because discipleship is part of who God is, as we talked about with the father and son's relationship. And we, being made in his image, have been given discipleship as a, as a gift, too. We need it. We want it. We are made far better by it. And we know God better through it. And God is glorified through it as well. Discipleship is ordained at the deepest level and prescribed at the highest. And speaking of Solomon and his people, how about God's chosen people? They're chosen, right? Kind of similar language and situation as when Jesus chooses his disciples. Because we're seeing the same pattern. God is a God of discipleship. Even on the level of nations, it's personal to him. Isn't it interesting that God didn't even start with a nation, <clears throat> right? He started with one man who was not particularly notable. 
but he started with Abram. This is because from the very beginning, the basis of God's relationship with us is individual. And this special one-on-one -on -one relationship is normal. It's not the exception. It is the expected norm. Genesis 12, <clears throat> 1 to 3 says, Go from your country, this is talking to Abram, Go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is all from one single man who God built his holy nation and people from. God said, follow me to Abram. Just as Jesus said, stop what you're doing and follow me. Leave your family and follow me. Be my disciple. God built a family which bore the mark of our awesome God through this discipleship orientation, <clears throat> through and through. And God built a people who stewarded this understanding of the Holy One. The Jews, even up to Jesus' time, they considered themselves to be disciples of Moses. Kind of same thing. This culture of discipleship in the worldview of God. Egypt, for a time, reaped the blessing of God through his people, the Jews, because of these blessings that were promised to Abram and the nation that came from him. Right? But Egypt didn't treat it as discipleship. They forgot who Joseph was. They forgot who the God of the Jews was, and they enslaved the Hebrews instead. And again, God called them out and said, follow me, through Moses, another one of his disciples, one-on-one -on -one disciples. He even led them, God led his nation with physical presence through the wilderness to Sinai, right? A cloud or a fire, as a master leads a disciple through treachery, through all the obstacles of life, God led his nation. Israel was a nation chosen as the corporate disciple of God. Because he treats them like that, as a single entity. God called out from among the nations to them to be an example for others to follow too continue this legacy of discipleship, even on the corporate level of nations, right? Isaiah 51, 4 says, listen to me, my people, hear me, Israel, for my law will be proclaimed and my justice will become a light to the nations. My mercy and justice are coming soon. My salvation is on the way. My strong arm will bring justice to the nations and all distant lands will look to me and wait in hope for my powerful arm. There are several of these types of passages with Israel as the light of the nations. You know, and the Messiah is definitely folded into them, but the base level also stands where Israel's relationship with God is to be an example for the rest of the world. It's a call for the other nations to be blessed and to follow them. We see when countries do that, that is absolutely the case. That they are blessed. We're sitting in a nation right now that is that. The girls were, you know, looking at all of the, the ingenuity and the success of our country. Um, all of these things. And specifically, um, in some things that we're going to check out in a second here. Uh, <clears throat> when a country embraces the relationship and the law and worldview of Israel, there are blessings to follow. So Deuteronomy 4, uh, verse 5. Let's look at that, the next step here. Look, I now teach you these decrees and regulations, just as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may obey them in the land you're about to enter and occupy. Obey them completely, and you will display your wisdom and, and intelligence among the surrounding nations, when they hear all these decrees, they will exclaim, How wise and prudent are the people of this great nation! 
For what nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on him? And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as this body of instructions that I am giving you today? This is what this is the the dialogue right between Moses and God and Israel as Moses is in his last days. And this is how God's disciple nation of Israel is supposed to be before the watching world. America is, or at least was, a disciple of Israel in this way. You know, there's a reason why we have one of the best, even today, the lingering relationship we have with them is one of the best in the world, because we've always respected and taken Israel and its worldview and its God seriously in our country <clears throat> and been blessed by that. We, as America, have been historically known for our righteous and fair laws, just like they're talking about here in Deuteronomy. We have been known for our protection of the weak and our charity for foreigners, right? For our blessings and strength that have come from the worldview and from the nation that has been built up around it. Adam just experienced jury duty um, the other day. Ask him about it. Ask him about the, the profound nature of sitting in a trial and being a part of the fair system of righteous judgment and evaluation of a person amongst a, a fair and just trial of your peers. It's not a perfect system, but it's basically the best the world has ever come up with. But you know, why did God even choose Israel? Like, there's been good fruit, right? But why did God choose Israel? It's a pretty tiny, insignificant nation on paper. If God is building a nation from scratch and he is all-powerful, you know, and can multiply his people like rabbits, why not build a great nation to scale on the word world stage, you know? Why not have it be, why not America be God's nation? One of the, you know, a world superpower. Why not? Well... God does things differently than what's intuitive to us, right? And so as he's choosing disciples, whether it's an individual or making it into a, a nation that he views as a single entity, God does things different. And we should stretch ourselves to really try to conform our mind to how God values and does things. If God is building a nation from scratch, he does it differently. <clears throat> To make it into something different right like God always does things different he dies so that he may save he embraces the poor to grow rich he chooses the weak to show his power and among the nations Israel is God's disciple and they fit the bill they're stubborn stubborn and they're full of failures they're full of opportunities to be taught they can take no credit of their own. And when God came directly to us, what did he do? Well, he did if, what we would expect if we were paying attention. He chose a few select people for personal discipleship. Only 12 disciples and a ragtag crew at that. Why didn't Jesus start an organization when he wanted to start his ministry and build his church in the world? Certainly that's what we found to be more effective at things, right? To build this big organization, have a bunch of staff, be able to have different departments for the efficiency and operation of things. Like, why wasn't God smart enough to do that? Well, that's not how God operates on a profound and deep and basic level. He didn't recruit and train skilled teachers. You know, he didn't lean into the large crowds and have a Sermon on the Mount series or tour. You know, there's probably got to be lots of hills over there. Could do a Sermon on the Mount tour. This mount and that mount and that mount. Probably would have been hot stuff. Like, honestly, his people wanted him to do that. Or build a big following and make a synagogue or a school. That's what everyone wanted, even for good reasons. But this is not God's way. 
The disciples asked Jesus this question in John 14, 22 to 23. Judas, not the bad Judas, but the other Judas, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world at large? And Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Jesus emphasizes the personal, the one-on-one -on -one relationship, making his church, his body, be always growing on this level. On this level. Not that it starts at the one-on-one -on -one and then grows beyond it and then gets more efficient and grows on this bulk level, but that he is always, regardless of what century or you know, decade, millennia, whatever it is, it's always on this personal and one-on-one -on -one level. Jesus says right after his response, and remember my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. And again, he's telling, he's telling us that he's emphasizing each individual and he will come be with them personally in that discipleship relationship. And that is why he doesn't go for the big bulk conversion like that. You know, he's going for the individuals and he's starting the tone with a very small amount of individuals, small enough that he was individually able to disciple them so that they may go and disciple others and more and more and more. But individual relationships all around, personal attention. And he's saying that his father has that same mindset because Jesus was a disciple of the father and they think as one and they act as one and ultimately eternally they are as one. We cannot wait for the church body at large amongst us here. We cannot wait for the church body at large to make and teach disciples not because it's not helpful, not because we can't or shouldn't use other people as good support and resources. You know, speak tether ground, this little phrase that we've used to say that you don't have to do it alone, right? But the ownership, the individual investment and relationship is one-on-one. -on -one. It's not that we can't share the burden of that, not because it's not helpful, not because we can't or shouldn't use other people and good support and resources, but because it's not how God works at the base level of it. It's not how he works, not how he has ever worked, not how he ever will work. Discipleship is one person to another definitively. And God wants us to take ownership of a person and teach them to love their primary discipleship relationship, their master and Messiah, and to obey his commands. After Jesus' resurrection, Matthew 28, <clears throat> verse 18, he says, The scripture says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This, right, is the quintessential passage in Matthew <clears throat> for our need and command to teach and make disciples. It is the final command of our Lord and Master, and therefore it carries extra weight. This month we'll be exploring discipleship in more detail, but the point of today is for you to take the next two months very seriously because not only does it carry the weight of the last and definitive and crystal clear command of Christ before he went to be at the right hand of the Father, but it carries the extra weight of being the core identity and foundation of who God is and how he does everything, how he presents all relationships to us as his church, as his body, as his visible image on earth by his design and through these discipleship relationships. The goal of today is to put as much weight 
as I possibly can by my humble presentation on this idea of discipleship and for us to really pay attention the last couple months and to be able to the next couple months and to be able to carry that through the rest of our physical lives. Discipleship is not an option. Discipleship is not a side quest. It is a central way in which God brings us close to him. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Peter, John, James, and the other nine, these are not Gnostic relationships passing secret knowledge from one master to the apprentice and then from that converted master to the next apprentice. But the ownership and investment in an individual so that the church body may spread in health and maturity and depth and true knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Messiah and one with the Father. And all of the rippling consequences that come with that. It's not the exclusion of others, but the focus starting point of the legacy of God. This is discipleship. People are disciples by nature because we're created in the image of a God of discipleship between the Father and the Son, by extension in our parent and child relationships, by God's example through Jesus' ministry with his chosen disciples, even through God's relationship with his nation of Israel on this corporate level, still holds that image of discipleship, fostered from individuals and treated as set apart and special. This is a defining aspect of how God chooses to operate in his wisdom as in direct contradiction to the world's wisdom. And we are called to be transformed and adopt God's wisdom rather than the world's. We are set up through and through to thrive under individual leadership. So as a final passage to look at, let's look at Matthew 9, 35 through 36. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. My brothers and sisters, Jesus recognized that that is not how it ought to be. And he was sad and he had compassion on them. Go home and reflect. If you say that you are following Jesus, that you are a disciple of him, but you do not have disciples and do not have these relationships in your life, then that is mighty confusing. And we have to figure it out. Because we walk in both the commands and footsteps of our God. So tell me, how central is discipleship to your transformed life? in Christ. How central is it? That is my first official question. How central is discipleship to your transformed life in Christ? Number two, how personal is your God? Just how personal is your God in your discipleship relationship with him? And thirdly, what experiences or observations of discipleship have had an impact on you? What experiences or observations of discipleship have had an impact on you? Go ahead and reflect on those things. You're going to have a long time to reflect because we are going to go into communion with our body today. So if I could, I would like to call up <coughs> the other elders slash elders in training uh, to orchestrate our communion uh, time together.